Hey friends, this is Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, and I'm your host, Julia Washington. And on today's show, Mario Mello is here again, and we are discussing the horror comedy film, The Blackening. And yes, you heard that correctly. I said horror and comedy. This film was released on June 16th, 2023 to mass audiences and was written by Tracy Oliver and Dwayne Perkins and stars Dwayne Perkins, Antoinette Robertson, Sinqua Walls, Grace Byers, X Mayo, Melvin Gregg, Jermaine Fowler, and, and, and a few others that you'll recognize. So now let's get into it. So are you ready to talk about the blackening? Yes. Okay. So as uh, first, everybody, welcome back, Mario, who's like probably our most frequented guest at this point, which I'm not mad at. Um, he must, uh, so, Mario, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Always it's, a pleasure. Just so everyone knows, it's really early and on a Saturday and just, I'm not good at Saturday mornings anymore. I used to be. Now I'm not. I don't know what's happening. Okay, so the Google, the Google summary. I always love pulling it from Google because it's so interesting what Google has to say. Here we go. Seven friends go away for the weekend only to find themselves trapped in a cabin with a killer who has a vendetta. They must pit their street smarts and knowledge of horror movies against the murderer to stay alive. Which is actually pretty accurate. Yeah. And it's eight friends, right? Actually, I think it's like nine, isn't it? Because the two in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because one of them is kind of like a last minute. Addition. It's like, yeah. Okay, friends, you know how we roll here. This is going to have some spoilers. So buckle up, buttercup. If you, haven't seen, if you haven't seen the movie, go watch it, then come back and listen to us what mario said <laughs> but first i gotta applaud you because i was like this is a little intense at times i was like is julia gonna survive this because julia is like scary movies and i was like it's a little more intense than i thought it would be for a comedy horror movie but i i mean it didn't bug me and that's my right on my alley but i was like yeah thinking, i was like oh my goodness is julia even gonna be able to sit through this she's probably like gonna have a blanket and half her head's gonna be covered i was like but I feel like she's going to love it. That's literally so, how I watched the so movie. You have, to, you have to tell me how your experience was because I never sat through a horror movie with you, so I don't know how okay. you react. So for people who are new around here, I literally carry my movie world to be rom-coms and light drama on purpose because when people ask me if I've seen Get Out, I respond with, I live Get Out. <laughs> I don't need to see it. I saw the trailer and I thought, uh-huh, that's my life. Got it. <laughs> Jordan Peele's also mixed. Um, also as a white mom. Um, so I go, so I, I go to the movie theater and I get my snacks and I walk in. And it's, you know, I I am of the generation, I think you are too, Mario, because I don't think that we're far apart in age, where you used to have to show up early to get a good seat to the theater. So yeah. that's been very hard to like break because it was 20 years conditioning to do that. And now it's like, oh, we don't have to do that anymore. So I was very proud of myself because I showed up 15 minutes before the movie is supposed to start. As a whole, I don't like getting there after the lights have gone down and crawling over people. I think that's fucking rude. So I get there early enough to get my snacks, to eat my snacks, and then get cozy. And yes, I have a movie theater blanket. So I get there, I walk into the theater. I'm the only one. There's no one else. Was this a matinee? Yes. Okay. Because I ha I was like, I got to go during the day because if I go at night and I leave and it's dark outside, I'm going to think something's chasing me. Yeah. <laughs> so I go, I sit, I eat my snacks and I'm sitting there. I'm like, if, it, and when, mind you, when I bought my ticket, the theater was like half full. So like my normal space that I like to sit in, I couldn't get because those seats were sold already. Um, so I'm like, where the fuck are all these people? 
then people start trickling in. Not everyone who bought tickets showed up. My row ended up staying empty. Um, but the the theater ended up being more full. But pretty sure I was the oldest person in the theater. Everyone was clearly horror fan people because as the trailers were rolling, which I forgot would all be horror slash scary movies. <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> um, they were like, oh my God, that looks so good. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Oh my God, I can't wait for that movie. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there with my blanket over my eyes, lightly humming to myself so I can't hear stabbing noises. <laughs> So that's how that's how it started um and but yeah i do i had my i did watch a lot of it with my eyes partially closed fingers over my face blanket curled around my head <laughs> <It's pretty good. laughs> but it was a fun ride it really was i walked out of it and was like fuck that was really good i would go see it again now that i know all the things that happen, all this, the points where there are jump scares, all the events where people are harmed or injured. Now that I know that, I'm like, I'm sure there's stuff I've missed because I was too busy, like, clenching my face <laughs> in concern. <laughs> so I, was, I told my kid, I was like, we ha you have to see it. It's so fucking funny. We need to go watch this. Like, I would be willing to see it again during the day. Oh. What did you think of it? So I went to an evening show because that's usually I usually have Well, this is your genre. Yeah, and so it doesn't bug me. But I was surprised too because I was like, like it was already the second because I went. So I wanted to go on team, team mm -hmm. but I didn't get to, I forget what well, something happened to where I wasn't gonna be able to make it. So I was like, okay. But then I went on Tuesday because it's on well, for me, it doesn't matter because I'm the I have an unlimited pass, but it's five dollar Tuesdays mm -hmm. at Regal. So of course the theater was busy, and I was like, oh good, because you know after a movie plays for a week, if it's not like as big of a hit, you know sometimes it's like scarce. But yeah, was, you can't I get was, a ticket past Thursday until Friday. Yeah. <laughs> so I was excited because their theater was pretty full. Oh, that's good. So I like to see comedies and stuff with groups of people because mm -hmm. I feel like you know you get a better experience because everyone's right. enjoying the movie mm -hmm. so um but yeah our audience was like echo laughing and stuff and i i told you i think i told you before there was a couple of times where i got i got the jokes and i was laughing but i didn't hear anyone else laugh so i was like oh, i don't think they caught the reference same thing happened to <laughs> me i was giggling and cackling through the whole thing and there were points where it was only me laughing, especially with Grace Byers character, Allison, because she's mixed. Mm -hmm. So like for me, that was I'm like, oh, I've been in those situations where people are like pointing at a zebra painting and being like, bitch, that's you. And you're just like, you know, that's okay. funny. when they were talking about that, I was I literally thought of you, too. And I was like, I wonder if Julia's have to deal with it or I wonder if she's yeah. heard that line before <laughs> or I wonder if she's even said this. before. Right. <laughs> Um, so the significance of Juneteenth for those who haven't seen it yet is they come together, these college friends come together the weekend of Juneteenth to celebrate Juneteenth. And it's like this bit, you know, Juneteenth, if you don't know about Juneteenth for my people, uh, go educate yourself. Cause that's not, this is not the time for that. Cause we're talking about the blackening, but it is a big deal in the community <clears throat> and becoming more and more popular, um, and it's now a federal holiday, even though they won't teach about black history in Florida or Texas. It's fine. Um, which is ironic because Texas and Juneteenth are is the reason why Juneteenth exists. But anyway, yeah. um that's another story. That's a whole that's a whole other podcast. Um, but the cast is stacked. So I posted on TikTok. I was at a family dinner for my son's side of the family. My son's dad is white. And I was telling everybody how excited I was about this movie and like how people were like, suck it up that you don't like horror, go see it kind of tone, right? Like that was, you were more polite about it than other people in my life, but everyone's like, you love all these people, go to the movie, like support your people. And I was t telling them about it and everyone around the table was like, oh my gosh, that sounds so funny. Like, why haven't I seen a trailer, da, da, da. And then they're like, who's in it? And I was like, nah. Y'all, these people are black famous. You don't know who any of them are. And they're like, what? We know black actors. Like, they got deeply offended that I said that. So I was like, okay. 
So I pulled up IMDb because I did not want to miss any single person in the movie because I knew it was a small cast, but I didn't also want to like get it wrong, right? Because I've seen the trailer, but I hadn't like at that point, like stalked the IMDb as much. So I start reading off all the people in the movie and like, no, I don't know that name. No, don't know that name. Oh gosh, I don't know who that is either. Like someone else pulled up their phone and was like showing the pictures of the people. Nobody knew who any of these people were around the table. And it was like, thanks for proving my point. <laughs> I gotta admit, I only knew like four of the actors. Like that's the rest, still more than everybody. The rest I was like, I, I've seen them before, but I couldn't peg them. And then one yeah. of them was like, okay, that's why they were kind of like supporting character or didn't have a yeah. Big role. Yeah, that's Mario. That's still more than these people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. So you have your. So we have our friends. We have Lisa, Dwayne, Namdi, Allison, Shanika, King, Clifton is the surprise addition that everyone had forgotten existed. Morgan and Sean, and I think the biggest name that everyone will recognize in this film is Jay Farrow. Mm -hmm. Um. Morgan is played by Yvonne, who I always get her last name wrong. And she was in um, Insecure. She played Molly in Insecure. So when I saw her in the trailer, I was like, oh, I'm so excited. I love her. Like that's, I feel like she's not in enough stuff, like on a bigger scale. Um, earlier when I mentioned Grace Byers playing Allison, for those of you who have listened to our Harlem ed episodes with Cache Jackson Bell. She is Quinn in um, Harlem. But anyway, this whole movie is just so good. And it oh, and it's a satire of horror movie tropes for Black people. Like the tag is literally, we can't all die first. Which in many horror films in history, <laughs> the Black character does not usually make it. <laughs> no, it's like what, there was a Black character in that movie? And mm -hmm. it was two seconds into the film. <laughs> and that's why Jordan Peele is very important because he kind of helped change, I feel like, change that mm -hmm. perspective and those horror movies that feature almost all Black actors, which is amazing. Yes, I I agree. And Jordan Peele is so damn funny, Um, which sometimes the funniest people have, like, really, like, I don't want to say sick minds in like the way that we think that a serial killer has a sick mind, but like that sort of ability to be twisted to make horror movies because you see the world differently when you're a comedy writer. Yeah. I'm not a comedy writer, but I've talked to enough comedy writers at this point in my life where I'm just like, mm, mm hmm, you got there and that's you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not in a bad way. I don't mean that in a bad way. Anyway, so it opens up and you have all these people. So you have um, the two characters. I think it's Sean and Morgan are the first two mm -hmm. who show up to get the apart the house ready. It's literally a cabin in the woods, like <laughs> way out, like like in the middle of like this. You have to take this windy, scary road to get there. Um, and Sean has found a game room and he's like, "Babe, come on down," because we you know know that Sean and Morgan are dating. So they go down to the game room and they find this game called The Blackening. And they open the box. So this is, here's the thing, y'all. This movie is black as hell and I am here for it. Um, They open the box and the little device in the center that sort of navigates the whole game is... um. A Sambo, which is a horrific sort of caricature from the early 20th century that was used in a lot of marketing materials and is so offensive, but like was culturally acceptable as representation of Black people for a really long time. And the jokes that proceed every time one of the characters opens the box and like, what the hell? And they're just like... <laughs> it's so I don't even know how to describe it's so funny it's so funny but the whole premise of the game is they have to answer these questions sort of to like prove their blackness um and if you get it wrong the only option is death <laughs> death <laughs> so death is the 
if they get it wrong it's death it's death like there's no other alternative it's either their death or in the beginning it's morgan's death because at one point like morgan is you know i'm again sorry guys there's a shit ton of spoilers i forget what question j uh sean and morgan get in the beginning where they fight over it because like this game because no one's taking this game seriously <clears throat> they don't realize it's like a legitimate game they have to play to survive yeah. until like there's a morgan and sean find out the hard way but their question that they get is like name one character in a scary movie that's black that's that survived and they can't they fight they fight over it well i don't know if they I mean, there is. There they is, just but like, in, yeah. they just, they're fighting over <laughs> what the answer is, and they have only so much time to answer, and then the thing speaks to them. Um, I'm not a scary movie person, as we know, and I admitted to a friend yesterday, I spent a lot of formative years with scary movies playing in the house and me watching from around the corner because I wasn't allowed to watch them because I was too young, but that didn't stop me from standing there watching. So I'm familiar with some of the tropes, but it's been a minute since I've watched scary movies like for recreation. So Mario, you are the scary movie guy. <laughs> Talk to us about all the tropes that they address in this movie. Oh, there's a lot. There's the, the well, I mean, the whole, the main one though is the um we have to split up kind of thing oh my that god that was, was so funny because it's always i feel like it's always the white person in the, the film that's like we gotta split up we'll cover more ground or yeah we can look for help better and i feel like the, the black character in each movie is like no that's not smart but they do it anyway because they're outmoded and the so best that, go ahead <laughs> that one so that's probably the biggest trope that i found that I was like, oh my gosh, that yeah, that happens every time. The oh, best man. part of that scenario is it's Allison, played by Grace Byers, who is mixed, who suggests it, and everyone's like, "That's your white side talking." Like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, even like the even the the care one, is Dwayne, he's the gay character in the mm -hmm. film. Um. I think he mentions about like I'm gay so I'm good or something like that because usually because yeah. like one of the new horror movies is if you're gay you're usually pretty safe like oh because they don't kill they won't kill off the, the diversity character I guess or the, oh isn't that interesting yeah so he had made he makes like a comment about that or something or if he's gonna die he's gonna be one of the last ones to go or something mm -hmm, like that but, mm -hmm. so that was interesting too um I think you know what they actually mentioned that in Scream Four. I think that was one of the rules. Um, yeah, one of the new rules of the new generation of horror movies, which was interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, that is um, really interesting. Because <laughs> so there's a scene where <clears throat> they pull a card and they're like, "You have to sacrifice the blackest character." So they go through and like basically argue about who's the most black and like Nyamdi's character, it, they're like, boy, you are fresh off. You are out of the package black. At, like you are African. <laughs> and he's like, uh, no, Oakland. And then goes down all the things about, you know, says all the things. I that could be Jordan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and that, so that was hilarious. Oakland A's. Yeah. RIP Oakland A's pretty soon, actually. <laughs> so sad. Um. And like that whole scene was so funny because because Dwayne's character Dwayne his, and his that's his name in real life Dwayne Perkins, but his character Dwayne is like uh, I'm gay like you can't get like that is like like no yeah, you are not gonna come at me for that role like and I just I was like that's so funny because they kind of hit on these stereotypes internally in the community where it's like um. One of them's like, well, I go to therapy and we all know black people don't believe in therapy. And you're just like, I was dying during that scene. It was so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. I do want to read some headlines that exist that are, uh, uh... 
So there's this website called a slash film.com, which by okay. the title, you could obviously tell I don't read from it. <laughs> yeah, I know what that is. You know, I think, it? I, follow, I think I follow them. Yeah, their headline is The Blackening Review, a horror comedy that is neither funny or scary. And that was written by Mike Shut. And I have not, I don't know anything about him, but I'm just going to assume he's a white guy. <laughs> that mean. Um, Okay, so then the Hollywood Reporter's headline was Tim Story's Sharp and Witty Subversion of Horror Tropes. I I was like, okay, that's promising. And then, of course, our standard uh, check-ins because the New York Times and RogerEber.com still reign supreme. <clears throat> the New York Times couldn't get more boring in their headline, which is The Blackening Review, Race Against a Killer. <laughs> I feel like that's that you could say that about any horror movie, no? <laughs> oh. Their sub headline is with more jokes than jump scares, this comedic horror film is as tartly amusing as it is provocative. So, Mario, I know you haven't posted after we record this, you will post your uh, review. So everyone go to movies with Mr. Mario on Instagram to read it. But like, give us your overall review of this film. Pretend like you and I are Roger Ebert, Roger oh Ebert and I forget Siskel's last first name. Just, oh, Gene Siskel. Gene, Gene Siskel, Siskel. Thank you. Yeah, yes. we're them. We're a cooler, yeah. better looking version of them. <laughs> um. Definitely enjoyed it. I think it does prove a point. I think that's what the directors will doing. I mean, I, I told you a little bit. It is a little predictable for me. Mm -hmm. I feel like, like yeah, I, I feel like maybe that's what the director was kind of going for was the predictability of a horror film. But at the same time, I was like, I felt like they. I wish they would have like had some su more surprises, I guess, because if they're, you know, if you're trying to talk about the tropes of horror from a black character's point of view you could have kind of reinvented it a little bit kind of like mm. a Jordan Peele thing but like I said it, it could have been the director that's what he wanted so I mean respect to him mm -hmm. um I think it it kind of brings up that conversation that maybe people aren't ready to have and I think that's why sometimes those those headlines come out like that because they didn't get the point of the movie mm -hmm. um I was talking with somebody who did see it and they're like, oh yeah, it reminded me of like a scary movie. Like they're making fun of horror. I was like, kind of. I mean, yes, they're doing that, but I feel like this is more of like, they're kind of like laughing with the, the people. Like they're not yeah. la laughing at the people, they're laughing with the people. Um, so, but I thought it was genius. I, I, like I said, I laughed so hard in some of these scenes and the audience really liked it. So, um, I definitely would see it again, and I'm definitely one that I'll add to my collection when mm -hmm. it's available and stuff. But um, just to see that point of view from a, a different perspective was um, inviting and very entertaining, too, because, you know, <laughs> those, those kind of characters always get the sidelines. So it was nice because it's like they brought all every, like, stereotypical um, Black person, I guess you would say, in a movie. Mm -hmm. And put mm -hmm. them all together in one room and then but it was like it wasn't like necessarily a, a fault either like they were able to use their personas or their um that trope to their advantage you know with the killer or to get out of a situation and stuff so it was like <laughs> like there's a scene with the chili powder <laughs> oh my god so funny <laughs> they're like what am i gonna do with this and they're like just keep it and then she ends up using it yeah helps save somebody because you know that's what she had with her, but it was like they're very resourceful. But yeah, I I enjoyed it. I think people who didn't like it or thought it was okay just didn't get the point. And yeah, and there are I mean, there's movies and that's all for you. Sometimes you don't get the point, and that's why more movies like this need to be made. I I feel like because, but but I, it's important for that community to show up too. Like like you said, like you're not one to go to these movies but you like you felt it was important for your community to go support that movie mm -hmm. you did and you thoroughly enjoyed it so i think mm -hmm. that's the message we need to send to people too is like support your community because if you if you guys keep saying like oh i want this i want that but you guys aren't helping or supporting it it's 
never gonna get made it's never gonna get done so. yeah exactly and that's the thing and it's so hard already i don't know personally obviously because the world i live in is not hollywood um but i do know from listening to writers and directors that are black who talk about their experience with trying to make television and movies <clears throat> it's hard to get a black movie or black tv show greenlit in sort of this mainstream sense i mean <laughs> case i mean i hate to go back to my story around the dinner table but that's like i feel like that is such an um a moment of like this is how true it is that they're because you know we have black famous people right and like this that just proved the point that like mainstream isn't cued in to anything that isn't predominantly white especially because like even like even like on TikTok, people are like, oh, I recognize Jay Farrow, like as a response to my TikTok. They're like, oh, I recognize Jay Farrow. Fair. He's probably the most visible person because he was on SNL mm -hmm. for all those years. I love, I love it when clip shows pop up of him doing all of his impressions. <laughs> so funny. But but I think I agree with you in that I don't think a lot of people who got it. And I was kind of worried I wouldn't get the horror side of it because it has been a really long time since I've seen a horror movie. Like, we're talking the 90s. <laughs> Which, if anyone's paying attention to my age, I was a child. Um, and so I got I got every I got all of the references. I mean, there's probably some maybe I, that I didn't get because I was so busy hiding my face. Because <laughs> I was scared about blood. <laughs> um... But I thought, because it was written by Dwayne Perkins and Tracy Oliver. And I thought they did a really good job. It was like clear they understood the assignment. In my mind, it was like, oh, you've yeah. seen horror movies. You understand the tropes. And now you're turning that on its head. And mm -hmm. I thought they did a really good job doing that. Because there's a scene where um, after they've split up <clears throat> and you have... Um, I think it's Lisa, Namdi, and Dwayne. And Dwayne. So Dietrich Bader is in this movie. For anybody <laughs> who loves him, he's I think he's hilarious. He plays Ranger White, which is like yes, named him <laughs> Ranger White. Like that's so funny. <laughs> um, he they come across Ranger White, so they've met Ranger White before earlier in the movie, and he's kind of being sort of like what are you doing here? Like this family never rents to, and they're like black people. And he's like, or only, or yeah, something that, yeah. And then he's like, no, I was gonna say they only rent to families. And um, no, I was gonna say they never rent to single people. They only rent to families. And it's kind of like, yeah, cause you kind of, and then they start running into these things where they're like, aren't we above the Mason Dixon line? Like, why is this weird racist thing here? And it's just, all these little moments right so they have this interaction with ranger white where it's just like they have to prove that they're there right like they have a list of everybody's name on the reservation um lisa even shows him her id to like prove that she's who she is and then he goes on his way well he comes back later because he heard noises or something i can't remember exactly why he said he came back so at this point, they've been terrorized long enough that they're like, do we need to, do we trust this white boy? Like, I think it's him. It could not be him. <laughs> so they go through this whole conversation of like, but every time people trust pe white people in a horror movie, they die. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just so funny watching that interaction. And then they decide to like split the difference and trust him. And it, and then they find, so the, the murderous villain wears like a, a mutilated Sambo mask as part of his terror tactics. And so they find the mask in his car and they're like, what the, this is horrifying. And then he's like, let me in. So he has gone. <laughs> he, did, car. he did the famous, I'll be right back. Line, yes. Which yes. You never say in a horror movie. Which you never say in a horror movie that I do know. Cause you're dying. Like, I am yeah. like, I understand that when he said that it's like, Oh, he's going to die. It's going to be scary or it's going to be funny. Who knows? Um, and he goes away, they find the mutilated Sambo mask. And so they lock, you know, they lock the car and he's like, comes running back. He's like, let me in, let me in. And there's arrows shooting at him. Cause that's the method in which everything, crossbow. everyone's being terrorized is with a crossbow. <clears throat> Their tires have been, uh, 
flat made flat because of this crossbow and they're like dude we don't know no like absolutely not like what the fuck is this and he's like i found that and then it's like this whole thing and then he ends up getting killed and they're like maybe we should have trusted him <laughs> maybe we should have let him in the car <laughs> <laughs> but i can I, just go ahead one of the lines Dwayne says in the beginning when they first meet him he's like he's like when did park rangers start having guns like that is very unsettling yeah <laughs> and then when he comes back they're like throw their weapons down because they're like i know better not <laughs> right that's right because they all in the house are like everyone needs a weapon and so they find weapons in the house and like lisa picks up a candlestick and which Dwayne is a has... great clue the clue thing he's like you look like colonel mustard <laughs> <laughs> all the references the jokes were so smart i don't know maybe i'm not that smart i don't know but it was just all the callbacks that were laid in there that I got. So that's why I'm like, I wonder what else I'm missing because I don't watch horror movies because there's the references to Clue were great. Um, and then so then when he does show up when they first run into him when they run into him a second time, they like put all the things down, all the weapons down, because you know, people have been shot holding a cell phone because someone said it was a gun. Yeah. When it was a cell phone. And so when he's like, okay, let's go, and they go, they like slowly move to pick all their weapons back <laughs> up and then run out and then run and follow <laughs> all right i do want to talk a little bit about the game because that scene when they're answering the questions because they have to i think they were tasked with having to answer 10 questions in a row correctly <laughs> yeah my favorite part about that scene is when they bring up like one of the questions is name all five black characters on friends and everyone's like the fuck <laughs> because friends is famously criticized for not having um too white. yeah it was being too white especially based in new york because new york is a very diverse city mm -hmm. so then they're all sitting around and they're like well <laughs> we all like don't look at me i didn't watch friends don't look at me i didn't watch friends is like the kind of the consensus but then they managed to actually name all five black actors and everyone likes you know everyone knows that aisha tyler was on it that was pretty much the most prominent character because she dated ross for um, a few, handful of episodes and joey <laughs> oh yeah and joey thank you that episode was weird <laughs> um and then gabrielle union was on an episode so they list all so they go through they're literally going through all of it they get all five right they're so proud of themselves high fives all around and the machine says you got it wrong the correct answer is i don't watch that show <laughs> i watch living single <laughs> I howled and I was the only one in the theater who laughed <laughs> and because I don't know if you've heard this before Mario I, the conversation in my circles with my girlfriends and me is um friends is a ripoff of living single mm. so I was like this is hilarious and these children in this theater have no idea. <laughs> That's how I felt. So then later on, there's a scene where I forget her name, but she's the. Is it Allison? It no, no, it's not Allison. Um, she's the one with all the alcohol, the one who's an alcoholic. Oh, Shanika. 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 And she is like, I forget one of the characters is like freaking out. And she like stops and she's like, if you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay. I was like, oh, I laughed so hard. But I again, I was the only one in the theater that yeah. laughed at that. It was like, how do you guys not know Sister Act? Like, Sister Act 2 is more, in my mind, like, we grew up on Sister Act 2. Like, Mario, when I tell you that my cousin Tanisha and I, every summer at our grandmother's house, it got to the point where grandma was like, you have to pick a different movie. I can't sit through that movie again today. But I was laughing so hard because I was like, oh my gosh, she really did just use the sister. Yeah. 
<laughs> and here's the oh, thing wow. when the first when she said if you want to be somebody i was like I, yep and you want to go so, like i i told you i sang along silently with her because it's like hot like at, and maybe this is an assumption we both made but it's like how do you not know that those are the next lines with when somebody says to you, if you want to be somebody <laughs> it's so it's funny good. it's so freaking funny i was like why is this the best movie i've seen so far in 2023 mm. that's my opinion <clears throat> that is. it's a horror film too i mario i know <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay another scene that i thought was freaking hilarious so there's a television and it has this weird freaky looking Sambo, which honestly is probably authentic to the shit that they were pumping out in the twenty or mid 20, early 20th century. Um, where, so the TV turns on and they are basically watching, um, uh, Morgan get tortured essentially. <laughs> <laughs> And so he, so this is the point where it's like, I don't know where this is going. So where's my blanket? Um, and so he's like got something attached to her head and he's like twisting it. Cause I feel like the goal is to like oh. pop off her head or something. Right. And then her wig pops off instead. And everyone's like, that's some good wig glue. <laughs> I was wondering if that was going to happen too. Cause when they were talking about the head, I was like, I know a lot of you know a lot of black women wear weaves and stuff. So I was like, I wonder if they're gonna do that. And they yeah. did it, and I laughed so hard too because I was like, that that was really good. Like, I again <laughs> was the only one in the theater who laugh out loud cackled. Oh. I was just like, that's so fucking funny. <laughs> like this movie's for the culture. <laughs> like, I think it it, it it might not be like a massive hit now, but I feel like it's going to find a cult following, especially when streaming it starts streaming and stuff. I think people are going to discover it, and I think that conversation will get brought back up. And uh, I It's one of those that I feel like will become one of those cult classics that we'll talk about 10, 15 years from now. Yeah, I agree. I think it's so... I think it's really timeless because even though it's clearly set in modern era so it will always be encapsulated in the 2020 in the 20 early 2020s i think it's still really timeless because they're doing a lot of things that are have been in, they're talking not only are they handling tropes that have been in horror movies forever and i know that the horror movie genre lovers do watch a variety of decades right like it's not like oh i only watch movies from like 2021 or something like people watch all the movies from all of the decades because why else would jamie lee curtis still be relevant in the halloween movies if they didn't you know mm -hmm. um and i think because of that and then too because the way that they tackle race issue the ra the existence of being black um i think that also makes it pretty timeless as well so like in <clears throat> If for some reason we have a major overhaul of our structure of society in the next 10 years, it's going to, it's still, and, and racism no longer is a problem, maybe it won't be a cult classic, but I'm pretty sure this will still be funny in 10 years. Because mm -hmm. they hit on things that are like in existence still and were in existence 30 years ago, 40 years mm -hmm. ago, 50 years ago. Um and it's just it's just so smart it's so smart though you know you can really tell that you can really see how the brilliance i think of the writing through it and i and like you said earlier people who didn't get it just didn't get it and that makes me sad for them because they didn't enjoy the movie and and what is life if you don't have joy mm -hmm. so i was i did i was reading something else too and uh, i think one of the critics was like this movie wasn't made for me. So I don't, I mean, I'm assuming it's probably either white or a, mm -hmm. a different ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it kind of, I mean, I don't know. I always feel like that's kind of like a cop out. 
Yes, that's the word I was looking for. Because it's like we have so many types of films throughout history and in Hollywood that, you know, maybe is it catered to my thing, but it's like I still always look for the craftsmanship or right. the, what that director is trying to do and stuff. Um so it's like I do encourage people like because I, I I wonder if that's maybe some reasons that people didn't check it out is because they're like oh that movie's not for me so I'm not gonna go watch it but it's mm-hmm. like I feel like if you don't expand your knowledge if you don't try things out you're gonna miss something really important or really enjoyable like you said it's like oh yeah and that and I Mario that statement comes up a lot from white straight men. Because mm-hmm. that was the controversy around turning red, if mm-hmm. you'll recall, and that man the managing the managing direct editor director whatever of that online magazine literally wrote like ha- essentially wrote well not literally sh- this my paraphrasing of it is he wrote a review that was like this movie is too niche because you have focused on an asian community in toronto how dare i have nothing to relate to about this film and people were like okay racist because i'm not of an asian community but i understand the culture around boy bands Mm -hmm. you know so like if i weren't a female who understood the mother-daughter dynamic I am a human who is watching boy band phenomenons happening every generation. Yeah. So it's almost like you're not even trying to enjoy the movie when you mm-hmm. say something like that as a critic, because you're in my mind, it's like you're unwilling to even see the quality and the craftsmanship of something, because if your only goal, and this is where representation kind of is a different conversation, right? Like when I talk about representation on the show, We really do get into like it's to kind of help normalize that these existences are real and not caricatures. And that's why Blackening is so brilliant because he's taking those caricatures and adding this layer of like truth to them. That's really funny. But on the other side of that coin, when you have white bros who are like, it's not relatable. I don't get it. It's not for me. You're just like, yeah, well, then that's your problem because you're not trying to identify or relate to a community that isn't yours, which Mm -hmm. is the problem. That's why we have such a divide because you're unwilling to see that other cultures and experiences exist and and unwilling to learn from them through film and television, which is my favorite thing to do, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't use that to be like, this is the only way that black people exist, or this is must be true for all of the Asian community in Toronto. But it does help me kind of think a little bit deeper about like, oh, I never considered what it was like to be an Asian descent girl in Toronto in 2002. But I have considered what it's like if I were to make a horror movie as a light-skinned Black person. (laughs) So it's like, open your brain a little bit, dude. Like, come on, critics. Like, I'm not, I mean, whatever. It's just, and I think it's another reason why having people review films who aren't just strictly white men that's why i'm always promoting your page because your lens is so much different than some of the other critics that i see out there writing reviews and i appreciate it i don't always agree with you but that's okay you know like Mm -hmm. you're still putting out your voice because we don't have a ton of men who meet your demographic writing reviews and I'm t- I'm just tired of reading white men review stuff, <laughs> <laughs> which is ironic because we pull a lot from RogerEbert.com and the New York right. Times. <laughs> but I do that as a contrast to say, like, this is what the New York Times is saying. They have millions of subscribers, and this is the influence that they have on what people are watching and seeing mm-hmm. or reading or forming opinions on for, you know, uh, international news, what have you. So that's my plug for everyone yet again. That's plug number two this episode of you vis- following Mario on the gram. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> so the tomato meter on Rotten Tomatoes is 87%, and the audience score is 85%. What do you pretty think of those for a, numbers? Pretty, pretty good for a horror film. Is it? Like, 
Yeah. Okay. There's only I feel, there's only like really a few that actually reach like above eighty. I feel like just because, really. Um, yeah, because I feel like horror is one of those like you either love horror or you don't. So mm. it's like I feel like it's always those critics that don't like it that are like skewing the little scores lower mm. um even jordan peele like i think his only like really like 90 above is get out the other the other two are all under 80 but like for me like i love them like they're great like so it's like yeah so <laughs> so for 87 percent or 86 percent is actually really good for a horror I love that. That's and it's more know. horror comedy. I get that, but it's still there's still a lot of horror elements to that. Movie, Listen, so. I was still scared. Okay, <laughs> I realized that I am very sensitive. I mean, mm-hmm. I've always known this, but then when I'm smacked in the face with how sensitive I truly am, mm-hmm. it's like, oh yeah, I need to go back and watch um, my perfectly. Which rom com shall I watch when I get home tonight? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, so I clicked into the the official people on IMDb, oh, IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Rotten. and yeah, like the New York Magazine uh, Vulture critic did not give it a fresh tomato. Yeah, and they said it just never really figures out how to be a movie, and I'm like, I'm sorry, did we watch the same movie? <laughs> Um, some guy who has a blog said hit too many sour notes to deliver its spoof smoothly gave it a C- like again I don't think you and I were watching the same movie sir yeah mostly the people who have given it a, a rotten score are white people so we're just going to call that what it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my god the daily beast even gave it a rotten has a clever hook and next to no clue how to entertainingly execute it. I'm sorry. Did we just not spend the last 45 minutes talking about how much we cackled, howled, laughed, and then also felt scared? (laughs) I feel like sometimes critics walk in skeptical. Yeah. And they already have a pre, you know. Yeah. Here's another black person who gave it a bad review. Y'all black jesus is coming for y'all for that one see and it's funny because it's like i get critics see these movies before audiences and they see it with other critics so it's like if critics in general aren't laughing as much as like an audience like Mm -hmm. they're gonna give it rotten so it's like you need to throw these critics in with actual audience members like (laughs) like on a friday night like yeah and, and listen to what the audience is doing and surprisingly and i that usually lately at least on Rotten Tomatoes the audience scores like either way higher than the critics or the critics are way higher and the audience like it's there's really ever no like balance but this yeah. one kind of has a balance yeah that's, so that's interesting surprising. yeah I do think there's some value like you said in seeing it with a full theater I what I'm granted it's my own fault because I went to a 1 p.m showing <clears throat> but I also knew it would still be daylight when I left the theater um but it's summertime, so I just assumed there would be, I don't know about you, but on my summer breaks in high school, we were at the movie theater almost every day. Yeah. Oh, that's also when tickets were four fifty a pop, so you could easily do some chores around the house for $5 and still get a movie ticket. Yeah. But there is a huge value to seeing a movie with a with a full audience, especially the intended audience. Like mm-hmm. when I went and saw Love, Simon, and I've talked about this before on the show, I think. When I went and saw Love, Simon, it was full of high school kids, probably queer. And the response to that film was so powerful and moving that now when I watch that movie, I rem- I feel that feeling. Mm. And it makes me love that movie so much. Like, I don't, I've never reviewed it on this show, like from a, like a critical standpoint, but I remember thinking this is amazing. Like people were cheering when the couple got together in the end. And like, it was just such a wonderful experience. Same with the across the spider verse. That's the newest one, right? Mm -hmm. 
people were into it and then clapped at the end. And I used to make fun of people who clapped in a movie theater, but then I thought, you know what? Who the fuck cares? We're having a singular experience, but also collectively. So cool. Like, and that mm -hmm. was so much fun. And I kind of wish that I had a full theater for the blackening because of the, I'm sure if I'd gone to the seven o'clock showing, it would have been a full crowd. It's okay. Maybe when they do the blackening too. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. They oh my God. It's like, I could totally see them doing that because then it would be um, the trope on sequels. Right. From the black perspective. So we'll and see. what's funny about the end when they're like, all right, now they've all survived. And they're like, all right, <laughs> now who's going to call, like, who are we going to call to get out of here? Because their tires in their car are flat. Everyone, you know, like they're essentially trapped. Like you can't go on foot down that road to get back to town. And everyone's like, and then someone's like, the fire department? <laughs> <laughs> I did have to go to the bathroom. So I like only, I don't know if they had multiple end credit scenes. No, it was just it, that one. Okay. Um, but what other, do you have any other thoughts about this movie before we wrap it up? That we no, didn't have. No, I've, I just, I, like I said, I encourage people to check these movies out and even if you don't think it's up your alley or your cup of tea, try it out because I think you will be pleasantly surprised. Um, and if you can't go to the theater to see it, wait, see it when it comes to streaming, digital, physical. Just check it out because I think I think you'll be surprised. And it was so go, funny. So, go support the the minorities out there. I guess you would say, right. Yeah, I mean, truly, because there's so much talent that's getting overlooked because studio execs think that um, creators of color can't bring an audience. But it's also like, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You not wanting to support the project and putting the same kind of money power behind it that y'all put behind Tom Cruise in the 80s? Or do we because when I told people about the movie, the majority of the responses have been, oh, I've never even heard of that film. like that's a problem mm -hmm. where's the marketing budget they should have given them billions of dollars to market this movie like and it would have been kind of cute to go like like you said over the weekend for juneteenth weekend because it opens with the juneteenth like with that's why they all come together and i was like god i didn't know that was a part of it yeah, I didn't realize that either until I started the movie. I was like, oh, okay. And then I went back and watched the trailer because that's usually what I do mm -hmm. after the movie. I watch the trailer. And they actually do mention it briefly in there, but it was kind of just like a, you know, they kind of just glanced over it. But in the movie, it's like actually like present. Yeah. It's but I'm like, I'm surprised they didn't pump that up more, like use that as part of the marketing, like Juneteenth. and Yeah. Juneteenth. Like you don't have to go on Juneteenth because you'll be at a barbecue, but go the day before. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my friend, where can people find you and support your work? Even though I've said it three times already on this show. <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram at Movies with Mr. Mario, where I do movie and TV reviews of things I'm watching and share the latest pop culture news. Yay. And he just shared based on a true story, which uh, he's the reason why I watched that show too, which is also out not outside <laughs> my norm. Damn it, you and Natalie are wearing me down. <laughs> well, not get you a to fan. Watch yellow jackets, yellow jackets. I'm working up to it. I love Christina Ricci and you know oh, Melanie Lin Linen Leninsky. I'm working on it. I'm getting there. Okay, friends, at the time of this recording, The Blackening is playing exclusively in theaters, and I suggest you scoot your booty to the movie theater to watch. And if you've stumbled upon this episode um, well after the release date, then I suggest you scoot your booty on all over to the television and rent it on video on demand. I cannot stop thinking about the people who gave this film a bad review solely based on the fact that it wasn't for them. So often, those of us not part of the major dominant culture have to wade through content that isn't by us or about us. And when we, and when asked if we watch something and have to respond with, eh, that's not really for me, because the industry is still so saturated with stories from the major dominant culture. But it's not the same thing. It's it's an inverse of that, really, if you think about it, because 
what about succession? What is it about succession that everyone can collectively obsess over or, and just like that, everybody's hate watching it together. So think about that for yourself and what that means. I, cause you know what I do all the time, because again, I just sat through a horror film and we know if you've been here a minute, I don't do horror movies, but I still did it because one comedy two, I recognize and understand that this movie is literally for the culture at the same time, there's still a lot of stuff in there where it's really funny that I really think that if you give it a chance, you would really enjoy it. Unless you're a horror film person. I explained the premise of the movie to um, an uncle of mine. And he said, thank you for explaining that. That sounds hilarious. I can't hang with horror. And I said, respect. So, you know, if, if that's the reason why you can't hang, I understand. But if you can't hang solely based on the fact that you see a black movie and you think that's not for me, maybe do some self-examination. Maria's review on Instagram is now live. So so I encourage you to go on over and read that. Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous is written and edited by me, your host. If you loved this episode, please share it with, well, everyone or anyone who loves horror movies or comedy movies or both. And if you want more content from the show, you can join our Patreon. If you join our Best Friends Club, you get access to our live happy hour and book club plus bonus content. Y'all. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time.